Uh, thank you so much for the intro and the kind invitation to speak at this amazing conference. Uh, today, I'm going to talk, give a talk with a title, you know, opening the black box, mechanistic interpretability, natural and artificial intelligence. And uh, where I come from personally is uh, physics. And then I love to share my own perspective of how I view this field. And the real motivation is that, the, you know, now like AI brain, like all oh, a lot of data coming out, like we really want to understand what they're doing, but then it's so complex, right? So it feels like science is really lagging behind like engineering and then the data collection before it's happening at the forefront. But then if you look back the history of what has been happening in science, there's a repeated trend that the engineering has kind of drove the creation of the new field of science or physics. And the uh, most famous example is a steam engine where uh, the first commercially successful steam engine came around, you know, 1712. And then there was this like almost chat GPT moment for steam engine around 1776 with uh, a Watt steam engine. And then f finally, almost like more than after a century, a study Carnot, who was a military engineer came in and asked a question of what is the efficiency limit? How can, you know, how can we make it a more reliable, et cetera, et cetera, which has led to the formation of the thermodynamics, right? And, but the, but then why do we even care about understanding if there's already engineering coming ahead? But then I would also argue that the scientific understanding then becomes a foundation for like amazing sets of like new innovations. Of course, engine didn't stop at the steam engine. There's a newer generation of engine that were, you know, built with the thermodynamics as a foundation. And then there is a repeated trend in history where industrial revolution creates new field of physics. Uh, was this example of, you know, electrical engineering going together with the solid state physics. There was this chemical engineering, which is a study of polymer, liquid crystal, everything, uh, which led to the formation of the salt matter physics. And the most recently, uh, we are all excited about AI and then also the, you know, large, large scale data coming from a uh, biological medical world. And then I was, you know, the interesting historical trajectories at the current generative AI system in particular for the image generation is supported by diffusion model where the word diffusion again comes from thermodynamics, right? So again, a uh, better understanding can lead to amazing, amazing engineering as well. And uh, with this background today, I wanna uh, give you two short talks where both aim to understand the uncover the algorithms underlying the natural and artificial intelligence. For the first part, I'm gonna uh, try to open the black box of generative AI, in particular, how the question is, can generative AI imagine? For the second one, I'm going to try to decode the neural code from the biology world using AI as a tool. So we now all impressed by how impre you know, stunning all the graphics coming out of all the generative AI for image is. Uh, there are many examples. So here's an astronaut riding a horse in space. Or here's a panda dancing with an Anna in Boston. Like both are really beautiful. But the question here is that the, what, is the, what is the algorithm behind, right? So are these models just remembering everything that you have seen from the entire internet uh, scale of training data and then just, you know, mashing it up a bit and then outputting something? Or there might be some like a true understanding or more concre concretely, like Einstein said, thinking is the activity of freely combining concepts and folding them into a fixed picture. So are they understanding some concepts and then combining in their novel way, ways, right? So these are uh, one of the most intensely debated topic right now in this AI world. And to make, take a step forward uh, here, uh, we did some uh, really simple experiment where we asked a machine to generate lizard with different color, white, green, blue, magenta, it, it looks perfect. Again, for the goldfish, it looks perfect. But then when we ask the same question for panda, somehow it fa it's failing to compose a concept of the color and then the panda, right? Where white is fine, but then the green and blue panda is not really green or blue. And then for the magenta one, it's, you know, making panda magenta colored in a really interesting way. While I would argue that if we ask the same question to, let's say, like elementary school students, they can draw a panda and then put some like color on top of it in a way that's going to make more sense than this. So the approach uh, that I'm going to repeatedly take is to ask the question of, you know, how can we make this system as simple as possible while retaining the essence of the phenomena that we see? So for this particular example, uh, the way we approach the problem is 
by constructing a synthetic data set, right? So here, uh, we set up a program. So pretend like you are a generative model and then look at this training set and then try to generalize to the test set, right? The question is, what is the uh, this test set object? Right. Yeah, perfect. Your intelligence. Uh, so here is the shape, color, mm -hmm. and then you, I think you have made association with how the tuple uh, corresponds to some you know features of these uh, images or graphics, right? And then to lay some framework for a further quantitative experiment, we have developed a framework called concept graphs, where we define variables like shape, color, size, location, angle, and then by specifying each of the shape, color, like saying it's a circle, it's its size is small, the color is blue, etc. Then there will be corresponding uh, set of images, but the and then we put all the geometries on the on the graph where. A uh, one hop neighbor, for example, the only difference from here to here is a shape, right? But then if you go here, then you change the shape from circle to triangle, or, and then you, you want to make it smaller. So the motivation behind this was that we can now define a distance measure uh, defining how far these two objects are, right? Then by formulating hypothesis based on this model, we can, uh, you know, for example, make an empirical uh, observation that, first of all, if you just show only one of the four images in the training data set and then ask the AI model to generalize to these one, two, three, four points, now, now I'm showing the movie where the AI is trying to learn to generate the rest of the four points by just seeing one, two, three, four, the uh, down quarter. And then what you're seeing is that, okay, so now the model is trying to uh, have already learned of the shape, but then the color is not stable yet, et cetera, et cetera. And then now we can see a pattern where X axis is the amount of time it's for the AI model is taking to learn. And the Y axis is the accuracy. And then all the blue curves are what the object that the AI has already seen in the training data set. And then the pink curves are for the objects that are one distance away from the training data set. And then the red curve is a uh, uh, process apart, this like little blue triangle, which is like two hops away from any of the objects that you see in the training data set, right? And then uh, we see some like a similar trend in the uh, emergent abilities in large language models. And then we can take a look at uh, this uh, rather sudden emergence of capability. And then, for example, we have uh, found uh, some like intuition that the multiplicity is what underlies a sudden emergence. And what I mean by that is that the the task of generating blue small triangle intrinsically requires you to understand all of the concepts of type, shape, size, and color. And then getting one of them, just one of them right, is not going to uh, give any contribution or credit to the success of this composed concept uh, generation, right? So if you open the what's happening under the hood and decompose the accuracy for the shape, size, and color, shape and size, these are learned much quicker than the color, but then since the machine is still missing the color, then there is this uh, multiplicative effect, and then it's not present in the overall performance. Furthermore, we can start to also give uh, practical insights using these synthetic little system. So one of the things that we have found is that the compositional generalization to minority class requires extensive training. So here, if you look at the training data set, you have three red objects and then one blue object which presents a color bias, right? Which is also common in real world. And then what you see in this uh, uh, optimization steps of the model versus accuracy curve is that the, all the majority concepts get learned really quickly and minority concepts, it takes more time to learn, which makes sense. But furthermore, uh, if the concept distance goes faster and faster away, which is almost like a minority squared like state, then you, you essentially have to train the model 10 times or even 100 times longer since the majority concepts are covered in the model, right? Which means that uh, we also tested this observation in more realistic data of the face where we can again construct the graph with a you know hair color, uh, gender, or smile, non-smile. And then we see the similar trend, uh, which basically says, if you want a model that's good for the majority people, then you, let's say, train for this some fixed amount of budget. But then if you also care about uh, minority concepts less present in the training data set, then you have to train, you know, 10 times, 100 times longer, at, at least in this uh, synthetic setup. And uh, to give you a you know, future direction that we are working on along those lines, 
uh, what I'm excited the most right now is this uh, new emerging interface between physics. What I mean by that is uh, really quantitative experiment and theoretical modeling and all the questions that psychologists has been asking. And then, but all of these things can be like mathematicized by the recent uh, developments of the generative AI. So we are also asking the question of, you know, what is a model for logical thinking? And then we are mapping it as a graph navigation problem and the training transformer to do the graph navigation problem to reproduce all the all kinds of behavior related to logical reasoning. Or we are also asking the question of, you know, can a language model combine skills? And then we, again, we can formulate a synthetic task, which is like 100% well-defined, and then we can quantify the behavior of the model solving this particular task. So overall, uh, the famous physicist, uh, Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg said, you know, when he was working on particle physics, it was a mess. But then that was the very reason why he jumped into the field. And then I see the field of, you know, uh, this particular field in a similar way right now, where all the definitions of the stuff that people are talking about are not really precise yet. And then there's a room for uh, seeking some simplicity and then making things precise. What, like what is imagination? What is logical thinking? What, what is like composition of skills? Like we can mathematicize it. And for the time remaining, I am also gonna, I also wanna share uh, quickly another line of work trying to use AI as a tool for understanding the algorithm of the brain's computation. And the subject of study uh, here is a retina. We have our retina at the back of our eyes and uh, as you can see, Retina already is like a multi-layer neural network where uh, there is a underlying cell types like bipolar cell, amacline cell, ganglion cell, ganglion cell at the back. And then uh, what I want to emphasize here is that the retinal neuron is the 10 to the 8, but then there is a much narrower optic nerve, which is like 100 times like scaled down, right? So the point here is that the retina already has to implement some algorithm to send the information. Just like how you are getting a YouTube video, it's not like if you calculate how much uh, gigabytes you're receiving at every second to watch the video, it's massive, but then there is a lot of underlying algorithm to compress the information to send it efficiently, uh, making it possible for you to watch high quality video, right? So the question is, what is the algorithm that the brain or the retina uses and how does biology implement it? To get that the question, uh, we took like a somewhat modern approach of training deep network model on this input output map of the retina where the input is a, a 2D space plus 1D time. It's a 3D tensor of the natural scene movie. So it's a you know really complicated movie uh, showing forests, movie, et cetera. And then the output is a recorded activity of the ganglion cell, which is a output neuron of the retina. And then we train you know, a multi-layer convolutional neural network to fit the data. And the first takeaway is that the, it works really well. I mean, we are throwing a lot of parameters. The conventional models were much simpler. It works much better than uh, traditional models, and it can predict the deep retinal response to natural scene almost uh, to the limit of retina's reliability itself in the sense that the retina doesn't spike in exactly the same way twice, given the same exact same input. Uh, there is upper bound, and then the model almost like reaches the upper bound of the predictability. Right. But again, as a scientist, I have some like issue here, which is that the, have we just replaced something that's really complex, you know, let's say biological neural network by another thing that's really complex, which is a deep network. But then we don't understand, like, you know, we don't understand either of them. Right. And then it, is there any scientific progress made here? So to make a scientific prog progress, what we turned it into is a decades of research about the retina done by neuroscientists. Right. So people have been uh, carefully crafting synthetic stimuli, in this case, uh, spatially uniform periodic flashes to the retina. If you do that, and then you suddenly omit the flash, so here's a sign, here's a retinal response. If you omit the flash, then there is a burst signal coming, uh, saying, oh, the temporal periodicity is violated. And then the timing of the burst signal is uh, proportional to the uh, frequency of the, or the period of the flashes being applied, right? And then we basically pretended like a neuroscientist and then did the experiment through the deep network model. Even though the deep network model only trained on natural scenes, it actually was able to reproduce this phenomena with artificial stimuli. And then did a similar thing for the motion reversal. Again, the retina knows of you know, Newton's first law saying uh, object in motion stays in motion. If there's a bar moving to the right, reverses its, its direction, 
again with the complaint, and then we see the same thing in the deep network, right? So again, this is just a reproduction stage uh, for now, but uh, now we can use these carefully studied phenomena as a way to contrast the computational mechanism of the deep network and computational mechanism of the brain. Because with the retina, we have a lot of ground truth already discovered by neuroscientists about how the retinal circuit we must be computing. And by contrasting this mechanism against the deep network, uh, we can hopefully close this gap, right? Again, the question is, do the deep network model the retina computes not just, you know, achieve high amount of correlation, but are they computing in the same way underlying it? So the approach that we take here is a model reduction. So the step is that the U start again from this convolutional neural network model, which has multiple convolution features across layers. But then we perform, we show some structured artificial stimuli that has like a lot of symmetry. So in this case, it's a spatially uniform and temporally periodic, et cetera. So for example, we can forget about the spatial dimension because it's spatially uniform anyway. And then we use some uh, trick from interpretable uh, machine learning to quantify basically the importance of neuron for generating particular response. So the question is, okay, so the, now this output neuron is responding to this particular artificial stimuli in a striking way, but then how much of each of these internal units are responsible for creating the response? And then I'm gonna skip the math, you know, technical detail, but what we can do then is to pick out only the important neurons for reproducing this particular restricted phenomena as a mechanistic interpretable subcircuit model. And then what we were able to actually achieve is to basically, uh, by going through this model reduction process, uh, we were able to propose a first experimentally consistent mechanistic model for explaining this particular omitted stimulus response, just like a periodicity violation response. So there was no, you know, like experimentally consistent handwritten theory there, but then by going through this like model reduction process, we were able to pr propose this interpretable mechanistic model. And the uh, inspiration here was actually like Picasso, right? Like where he started from this uh, really complex real object and then iteratively simplify it by drawing it where, you know, the deep learning in neuroscience from the science pers perspective has been like this, right? You draw a lot of strokes uh, with, in the analogy with uh, you throw a lot of parameters to describe something like really complex as is, but then the real understanding requires, you know, a removing all the unnecessary parts and then getting down to something uh, really uh, interpretable, simple, etc. So again, to uh, summarize the result without going too much into the detail, this model reduction process. So there were uh, three out of the four retinal phenomena, we already had the ground truth model of how the retina must be operating under. So these are already tested results. And then the deep learning model reduction process has yielded the subcircuit that, that is consistent with the existing literature already. So this process grounds this deep learning model as a you know model for the retina, which is making sense. And then for this particular omitted stimulus response phenomena where there was no real theory consistent with the experiment, we were able to propose something interpretable and mechanistic. And then of course, this deep network model can also handle the natural scenes, which is uh, much closer to the behavior of an animal. And then that has been the holy grail. But then we now have a you know, model that single-handedly can connect all the existing, existing literature in the neuroscience and then this like, open frontier for natural scene response, right? So now we are working on that front as well. And then in the future direction, you know, there are like many questions. For example, can we auto discover these novel nonlinear response of the retina by through optimization? Or can we then tile the space of natural scenes uh, with such a uh, discovered uh, new retinal phenomena? And as a final closing remark, so this uh, workshop has a really nice uh, title with like algorithmic science. And here's actually from, uh, you know, screenshot from a Feynman's lecture on understanding versus knowing things. And then Feynman laid out the process saying, oh, here's the process for science. You first make a guess, you com mathematically compute the consequences of the guess or the model, and then compare with the experiment. If it's matching, 
the model survives. If it fails, it fails. Like the model is dead, right? And traditionally, conventional approach has been saying, okay, this new experiment breaks the existing theory down. And then the next step was, to, okay, let's start from the simplest model. If it cannot reproduce the phenomena, then you iteratively add more and more complexity until you can explain the phenomena. That was like traditional approach. But then now we are at the point where there is another possibility where we have, where we start from like a really massive complex model that can fit the complex phenomena as is, just like how deep network model were able to fit the natural scene, you know, retinal response to natural scenes. But then do the process in reverse, which is to remove the parts that's unnecessary to explain some striking phenomena to the extent that the things are going to become interpretable, right? So again, contrasting with the previous paradigm of, you know, iterative, starting from simple model and then making things more iteratively complicated, we can go the other direction, starting from something complex and remove all the parts that's not necessary for explaining some particular phenomena of interest. And then this is a final slide, and then I'm looking forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you.